Is it right to be forced to pay for things you don't use? Is freedom of speech different than freedom of reach? Does the right to go to the supermarket supersede the right to own a gun? We'll talk about all of these takes and more on today's episode of Good Take, Bad Take. Hey friends, welcome to this episode of Good Take, Bad Take. This is the show where we gather social media posts that we see in our feed each week. We expand upon the really great ones, show where they're doing good things. Uh, We also expand upon the bad ones and show where they could probably do a little bit better. Uh, We try to have some fun and laugh along the way. My name is Britt. I'm here with my co-host Donnie. And uh, before we get started, make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. It helps us out. So uh, before further ado, let's uh, get into these takes right here. So the first one we've got... Uh, there's two, there's three, three, t- three posts. The first one is by Unusual Whales, uh, and they write breaking federal appeals court blocks Biden student debt relief program nationwide. Someone replies to it. Good. I shouldn't have to pay for others debts. Pretty good take right there. Uh, and then someone else replies to that person and they say, in that case, I shouldn't have to pay for child tax credits. I don't have children. I shouldn't have to pay for property tax. I shouldn't have to pay property tax. I don't have kids in public school. I shouldn't have to pay for Medicare or Medicaid. I don't utilize either. I shouldn't have to pay for Social Security, etc. Now, I think this would fall into a certain category that we've had before, but I'm curious, what what are your thoughts? Absolutely accidentally based. Yeah. Amazing take if you read it completely straight laced, straight faced, understanding, you know removing the obvious sense of sarcasm that the individual is la- lathering onto this post it's funny because all of the things that they lay out they they lay out in a very logical methodical way and and the only the only sort of discrepancies i would say is that you know for for medicare or medicaid the reason why you would want to pay into those if they were good systems mm-hmm. is because it's a future investment right just like any kind of private insurance yes. is going to be, um, it, you are paying now while you're not utilizing the service so that your money can grow and support a system that will take care of you when you do need to utilize it. Now, of course, Medicare and Medicaid are both terrible at doing that because they're publicly run. They, the administrative costs are terrible. The payout is minimal and it's all forced on you. Um, and, and, and it's the same with like social security and things like that. But, uh, you know, as far as, I shouldn't have to pay property tax. I don't have kids in public school. Correct. Yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you're, you're right. Or I shouldn't have to pay for the child tax credit. Yes, agreed. We shouldn't have to pay for things that we are not doing or using unless you voluntarily want to do so. It's funny because this line of thinking is present in almost every aspect of how people live their lives. Like if uh, if if you are like shopping at, uh, you know, if you're going to go get a haircut and the haircut is in the same complex as like a grocery store and then like you on your bill, you get charged for, you know, opening up the refrigerator in the grocery store or whatever. It's like, oh, like, why would I pay for that? I didn't go use it, you know, and it's like, well, it's in the same complex. So it's the same thing. It's like that's the same type of logic that's going on. Uh, you know, when these people take it as a given that that you should pay for things that you don't use. Uh when it comes to the government, when it comes to everything else, it makes total sense. Like don't pay for things that you're not going to use. Um, and so it's, it's funny because like you're saying they they expand upon this logic. It's like, Oh yeah. Like I shouldn't pay for property taxes. If my kids aren't going to be in school, I shouldn't pay for Medicare or Medicaid if I'm not going to use them. And it's like, yeah, like continue going, like keep, keep going all the way down the line, all the way up to social security. I mean, I guess he does at the very end there, go to social security. Um, and it just shows you, it's like taxation is theft, right? Like, Sure, there might be times where you do get some amount of it. And I, I guess the majority of taxpayers are net beneficiaries of tax services. I don't think they're very happy beneficiaries, right? Like, yes, you you get more out of it than you put in, but like the quality of what you get is actually not very good. Regardless, it's like, it's the same thing to those people. I would say, uh, you know, if the mafia came around and they shook you down and they said, hey, like you got to pay us protection money. And in exchange, we're going to protect you from the mafia on the other side, you know, of the town or whatever. It's like, well, it's still a shakedown, right? They're still robbing you of money. Yeah, you get a little bit of service in exchange. And yeah, the people on the other side of the town are not going to terrorize you. But that doesn't alleviate the terrorism that you have right now because you don't have the actual free choice to opt out of that tyranny. And a a great example of, you know, a kind of equitable comparison in, in the private market would be if you were renting an apartment and you did not own a pet and they charged you a pet deposit fee. 
and they charged you the additional rents that mm. pet owners usually have to. So, I, you know, when I rented um, a, a home with with Alexa when we first got married, it was like I think another I think it was like another 50 or 100. I don't remember uh, dollars a month because of the pet deposit. Um, and so, you know, because pets naturally increase, you know, mass or, or, or risk at least of, of their being damaged, um, our dog's great and didn't, but, uh, you know, because that risk exists, uh, you, you pay a little bit more for that service. Think about how ridiculous it would be if you moved into a, ho- a house or a property that you were renting or, or an apartment, um, and you got charged the pet fee, even though you had no pet. And, uh, <laughs> and it's like, well, what, what do you mean? You don't want to other people have pets. other people having pets? Yeah, exactly. Right. right. You, you, you don't think that, you know, pets should be. And, and the thing is, in the private market, even if you have a system like that, where it's like, oh, well, we actually charge a maintenance fee that the pet fee is, is included in for all tenants. And that's because we want, you know, our, our apartment facilities to be clean for everyone. So if, pet, you know, pets make a mess in the, in the common area, uh, that gets cleaned up for you, too. And, and the great thing is, as a tenant, you can decide, you know what? I'm going to go to an apartment complex that doesn't charge me for that kind of service because I'm not going to have a pet. And, and frankly, I don't want to do, I, I don't want to pay for other people to have pets if that kind of fee is wrapped in. And, and that's what, that's what private choice gets you is you get the option and maybe, maybe the option where you're paying that little bit extra, but everything clean around you is worth it because the, the overall quality is better. And yeah. so you're willing to take that hit. <clears throat> but, but the point is that that's an, that's a, an arbitrary personal choice as to whether or not you value that and it's all about your perception and and what your personal values are and so that's why in that kind of situation one it's great because again private incentives are as such that they will probably do a better job with the output than than a government program would but two you always have the freedom to to leave and that's one of the reasons why the output is better is because there's that competitive drive so this person lays out all these these cases and and yeah in each one of those cases there's a private you know, sort of corollary where choice is involved and mm. the the output is completely uh, improved from from the government um, offering. Yeah, that's awesome. Your your pet example is much better than my weird. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, like, yeah, yeah strip trying- mall version. <laughs> you 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 bought me time to think. I'm like, well, there's got to be like a real world type thing yeah, where that yeah. happens. So, yep. Yeah. All right, moving on to our next one. We've got a tweet by Elon Musk, the chief twit. And he writes, new Twitter policy is freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach. Negative and hateful tweets will be max deboosted and demonetized. So no ads or other revenue to Twitter. You won't find the tweet unless you specifically seek it out, which is no different from the rest of the internet. Uh, What do you think? (laughs) I give it a bad take, man. Like, it, It hurts because on the one hand, I do agree that he has the right to do this. I do agree that it probably makes the most sense for there to be uh, some level of curation on a site, you know, but it's very frustrating when the entire, you know, charge of going into taking over Twitter was to to inhabit this freedom of speech ideal and the, the uh, culture of free speech and all that. And now he's very quickly turning the corner on that. Whether or not it becomes abusive, we'll see. I I think the the only way he could really save this kind and, and I, I I tend to think this will not be as pernicious as Twitter was prior to his takeover. But I I would like to see a, a strict outlining of here are the guidelines that will you know cause a tweet to be you know removed from from the public discourse or whatever. And frankly, frankly, he's trying to make this distinction of freedom of speech is not freedom of reach or whatever. And he's saying, just like the rest of the internet, you have to go out of your way to find it. But that was also true of like the Hunter Biden story that got buried on Twitter. It's like, there is a difference technically between your tweet getting banned or like YouTube giving us a strike uh, for saying some things about, you know, that disease, which shall not be named and it's magical ointment cure. Um, There is a difference between that, like actual deletion or, or punishment and just making it hard to find that that is that there is a technical difference there practically speaking it's not that different practically speaking the way that twitter operates in many cases is large you know a, a large personalities tweeting out mass reshared individual links and so if that kind of stuff gets 
limited and it can't be reshared and you have to hunt it out specifically, <clears throat> you're not technically deleting it, but you're kicking it in the teeth to the point where I don't know that it makes a tactical difference. Yeah, I, you know, I, I won't, um, I agree with you that's a bad take. I also think that it's very possible this is some level 40 chess. And I know that gets like over applied, but <laughs> Elon kind of does some 40 chess stuff. I mean, even his purchase of Twitter had a little bit of that stuff going on. Um, but, you know, I, I think the problem, you know, when he says uh, freedom of speech is not freedom of reach, I mean, that was like, I feel like that was the Jack Dorsey like line that all these guys were saying. I don't know if Jack Dorsey necessarily said it, but I remember during this, like that was that was kind of a phrase that the left who was banning everyone or like or or shadow banning people would, would go to. It's like, oh, just because you you could say everything doesn't mean that I have to give you a platform to do it. It's like, okay, that's that's true. Um, I think the biggest problem then was that there was no uh there was no clear guidelines, right? It was it was up to the whims of whatever moderator looked at the tweet. Uh, and, and whatever personal values they might hold at the time, where I have a little bit more, like you were saying, that you think it might be a little bit better under under Elon, is that you know I think that he might actually have some some standard. Although I don't know, did you see his Alex Jones comment? Mm -hmm. I so did, I mean, yeah. th there was like a little bit of personal thing. I say, like, okay, like I guess you own it. You paid forty four billion dollars for it. It's like I kind of appreciate how clear that is in a lot of yep. ways. Yeah, um, it's like whatever. At least we know that whatever Elon likes will stay on Twitter, and what Elon doesn't like will not be on Twitter. That's a lot more clear than it was before, uh, and it, it doesn't have the veiled like uh, altruism and virtue that the, that the previous uh, ownership group had. Um, but yeah, I think that like, I think that people sign up for Twitter, they sign up for social media to get news, and they want to get news that is representative of the people that they follow. And then, you know, the algorithms are the value proposition from Twitter is that, hey, you know, you follow some people, you're also going to discover takes and discover tweets from people that you don't yet follow, but are also very much in line with the, the other people that you follow. And so I think that's like a big selling point of Twitter. I think that's what makes it a free speech platform in such a way is that, hey, you and I want to follow libertarian or anarchist type people like Twitter is awesome because it helps me discover other libertarians and anarchist, anarchist people. Uh, if Elon, you know, limits that because something is considered hateful or whatever, or against the, you know, the, the current fashionable opinion, I think the value of Twitter goes way down and that's not what he's, he's seeking to do. So I hope he doesn't do this. I hope this is just some, uh, like I said, 4d chess maneuver to keep, keep advertisers for a little bit or whatever, but who knows? We'll see. Twitter is a lot yeah. more fun with Elon in charge for sure. It's true. It's true. I would say, you know, I, I, the other, the other just tangent here, the other thing I always think about is, you know, Twitter seems to be doing fine in spite of all the engineers leaving. We'll see yeah. if that negatively impacts it. But just imagine how well it would be doing if people weren't actively chanting how it's dead every day. I, it, it's kind of it's kind of funny how it's like, it's dead, it's dead, it's dying. Run, leave. It's like, nothing's wrong. And everyone get out. And so now it's like, mm -hmm. if it does crumble, it's a little bit like, well, yeah, because everyone said it was dying, but yeah. it, it wasn't. But um, but the, the, the other thing I'll say about this is I, I wouldn't even mind his take here so much if he'd specifically kept it at demonetized i i can understand um wanting to remove the profit incentive off of certain tweets based again on clear guidelines i think would be the the key factor yes. there but that to me is one of the the better things about youtube in general although they have deleted stuff and they have you know they give copyright or not copyright but um you know content strikes like like our channel got um which is unfortunate, but I would say the first line of recourse usually is demonetization. Now, that can be a big deal for people who are creators, and that's their livelihood. However, I think that if what Elon is trying to limit is a sort of perpetual, you know, again, I hate this vague terminology of negative slash hate tweet or hateful. I, I, I just I think that's so uh, inaccurate and nonspecific. For, for describing the kinds of things they want to ban, but using his terminology. If someone wants to make their career doing that, I think that, you know, demonetizing that kind of thing is an actually effective tool without silencing the speech. You are, you know, making it so that advertisers don't get associated with it. You're, you're, you're keeping them separate. You are um, preventing there from being a, a major sense of gain from that. So if the person wants to do that, they're free to speak, but they're not necessarily going to generate money off your platform, which I think is a much more reasonable way of, of, sure. uh, of going about it. The, the de-boosted thing is, is my real problem here because, again, you are now uniquely treating some content 
um, and and silencing that speech rather than just removing the profit from it. Because, for instance, you know, I can go. Everyone likes to to call Twitter a, a public square. You know, the public square or whatever. So I can go into the public square and I can speak and I can say, "Hey, these are my ideas. This is what's important," and people can choose to listen to me. And then they can keep walking. I'm not necessarily going to make money now. Maybe if I'm really good, I create a following and then I start a, a you know pass around a hat and people are putting money into that hat because they like what I'm saying and they want me to keep doing it. That's great. But that's also, that's not what freedom of speech means constitutionally or what I think freedom of speech should be. You are not entitled to making money off your speech. You're entitled to express that speech. So, you know, when we're talking about the culture of free speech, um, you know, uh, as far as Twitter goes, don't, don't stifle and, and say, oh, well, you can still find it if you look for it, but we're just going to smother you with the pillows. If you're, you know, if you listen in with a, with a microphone up to his face and put in your earbud, then you can still hear him. That, that to me is not in the, the, the spirit of free, free speech. Demonetizing something, I don't think that that's necessarily a right of anyone included with free speech. I don't think freedom of speech means you're free to make money off your speech necessarily, unless you are able to, and you can do that through other ways. Uh, again, all of this going down to more nitty gritty as far as what Elon wants to do with his specific policies and stuff. Yeah, and I think the the biggest problem with the way I I don't know if I even have an issue with him not boosting it. I have an issue with that he says uh, hateful or, or whatever the word is because hate that that's like a word that can can progressively become mean lots of different things, right? Like. Yeah. Like what used to be hateful 20 years ago is like, hey, you probably shouldn't call people the N-word or, or things like that. It's like that or, or you're or you're putting their address out or calling for them to be killed or something like that. And that's been expanded to, you know, I mean, it was expanded to whether or not you believed in the vaccines or not. Right. Like that was hateful right. and dangerous uh, rhetoric and things to put out there. And so that's why I don't when, when we say like I want concrete things, it's like I don't want like terms that can progressively you could like assign it to an action like well i think that's hateful like that's that's not actually a good way to make rules or a good way to make a standard that people can actually operate in and around um you, you actually have to have like bullet point like hey we're not going to show videos of people getting shot you know on 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 twitter um or not even not show we, we're not going to uh monetize you can't monetize them and they're going to be limited like they're not going to algor algorithmically be pushed out to people i think that's fine like as long as that's like a clear standard and I'd even be fine if he if they came out and they said, "Hey, uh, you are not allowed to do uh, you know misgender someone or something." I, I personally wouldn't agree with it, but at least then it's clear, right? Like right. what the standard is, and people can say, me "Like, okay, well, literally this platform uh, says that I can't call a man a man and a woman a woman." Uh, then you can make your decision about whether you still participate in the platform or not. But because he kind of has this wishy washy stance on it, everyone's like, "Well, maybe I'll stay, maybe I'll go." I, I'm not sure. Either way, I think it's better with him running it, but this is still a bad take. Agreed. All right. Uh, we've got a tweet from JoJo from Jers, and she writes, your right to own a gun does not supersede my right to go to a grocery store and not get shot. Go for it, Donnie. I, <laughs> it's hard because this is almost not a good take or a bad take. It's, it's just almost like a nothing take. Like yeah. this is so detached from the reality of the conversation she's making so many assumptions in this take so it's it's a bad take yes because she's i mean there's there it, i i think i've said this before but i judged the debate in college and this was the kind of things that sometimes people would say in you know collegiate debate and it's like you're not making any of the links in your argument here you're saying two completely detached ideas that are vaguely in the same area but you're not drawing the connection or telling me why they're related at all. So like you're saying your right to own a gun doesn't supersede my right to go to a grocery store and not get shot. And it's like, well, okay. Hmm. If you're saying my right to own a gun does not, you know, supersede your right to not get shot. That is liter that is true, but that's also not what anyone who's, you know, pro second amendment, pro individual, you know, uh, safety right, you know, and, and self defense rights are, is arguing. No one there is saying my right to shoot people at random is absolute. No one's saying that. They're saying, I have the right to self-defense, and that means I get to own a gun. And you going to a grocery store and getting shot and me owning a firearm in self-defense are not linked. They're not related. Uh, much as these people want to convince you that just by the mere fact that people you know, law-abiding citizens, as the, 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 the right likes to put it, uh, own weapons, 
that doesn't that that, that is not the link with a criminal who's going to shoot or or just a, a malicious actor who's going to shoot uh, an individual uh, with a gun. That's they're they're completely separate ideals that we're we're talking about here. Yeah, it, it's definitely a bad take. I, I and like I was thinking about this, I was like, Joe, you know your uh your right to not get shot at a grocery store would actually improve if you carried a gun. You know, you you exactly. you utilize your right to self defense, and actually, your right to not get shot at a grocery store, your your right to life, uh, is actually protected even much more when other people uh, carry guns uh, in self defense and 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 for the purpose of defending others. So that that's what's just so funny about. I think there's more correlation between that than the correlation she's trying to make, which is like the fact that people that never have ever used a gun for for bad violence, uh, like the fact that they own guns does not mean that you're going to get shot. And I, they would try to say it's like, well, there's just so many out there. It's like, well, you know, a lot most most gun violence occurs with guns that have been illegally obtained or by people that you know the background checks and all the different things that these people uh, want to have in place didn't even stop them, you know, from getting them in the first place. And so. Uh, it's you're not going to get rid of guns. Uh, you're just like you're not going to get rid of grocery stores and the need to go to the grocery store. And you're not going to get rid of people that want to conduct violence. And so what are you going to do in that scenario when all of those things exist all at once? It's like, well, the best thing that you can do is one, go to grocery stores that are really safe or two, arm yourself up so that even if there was a, a you know shooter at a grocery store, which is very, very rare, um, you know, you have the ability to defend yourself and defend others. And so that's what I, I don't, these people don't get is like, yeah, I know the, the Colorado shooting that just happened. Like I, the guy was stopped by people that didn't have a gun, but in basically all instances, right? Some measure of force. I, even the guy in Colorado, some measure of deadly force is used to stop the person in their tracks. You know, whether it is a knife or it is someone's uh, stiletto or whatever it is, like they are using them to to stop the the person that's trying they they're using violence to stop violence that has been per perpetrated uh in an evil manner and so once someone decides to do that that's kind of the only option you've got or you've got to run so it's just they're not operating in reality i i, I feel like this take is not based in reality therefore it's bad yeah that's that's exactly right and i'm going to follow up exactly on that train of thought cuz you you made me think a lot of things but i've i've been holding on to this stupid simile uh so i want to say the 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 way that this sentence is structured is the, let's just let's turn it into into a different term to see how disconnected the, the terms are okay your right to eat a banana does not supersede my right to go down the street and not slip on it the banana peel that's a great one it's like yeah of course because if you ate a banana and threw the banana peel at me that would be wrong but that has nothing to do with your right to eat a banana. So that's just this, <laughs> the, the, the level of jumps that you have to make um, spelled out in a simple way. Okay, but what you were saying about, you know, how, how it's a measure of violence, that's, that's the other the aspect that people love to... That we, we have this debate about guns and gun rights as if, you know, the, the right to bear arms was written specifically and only about guns. And, and it's like if, the, if, if we lived in a different time where guns didn't exist, the founding fathers wouldn't have been like, well, we don't need a second amendment. The second amendment would have been written to be more along the lines of, you know, you have the right to bear swords and bows and, and rapiers, whatever it is. Like the, 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 the point of the second amendment and broadly speaking, the principle of self-ownership and self-defense isn't that I specifically have a right to a Glock. It's I specifically have the right to defend myself in whatever means necessary if I am violently attacked, you know, sort of the, whether you want to be a strict adherent to the non-aggression principle or not, broadly speaking, you know, if I'm not going out of my way to attack someone and I am being attacked, I have the right to use violence back in order to keep myself, my property, and my family safe. Um, and so, you know, in, in the Colorado example, it's like, it's great that people were able to stop the, the shooter with, without a gun. If they had a gun, that would be even better. Yep. And it's like if they had, I don't know, like mech suits with flamethrowers on them, that would be even better. It doesn't the, the <laughs> technology and the and the it doesn't matter. The point is that individuals have the right to defend themselves from aggression coming outward with whatever tools. As it so happens, this debate <clears throat> is is really focused around a specific subset of tools, being guns, because of their you know availability and because of their efficiency um, in in distributing out damage and and whatnot um and so that's where the debate is focused but but ultimately it doesn't matter 
what what it is. You have to think about the broader principle. So it's like her saying your right to own a gun doesn't supersede my right. It's like, yeah, right. Correct. We, we agree on that. Like my right to own a physical weapon does not supersede your right of life. That is true. But me owning that weapon is not creating that threat to you. And the right to your self-defense is on the exact same par as your right to life because your right to self-defense is what helps you preserve the right to life. So they go hand in hand, like you were saying earlier. Yeah. All right, moving on to our next one. We've got GNC, GN Cordova. I think that's uh, that's this person's name. And she She's retweeting uh, someone and commenting on it. So the first tweet that she's quote retweeting uh, is from Farm Boy Jakir. And he writes, without Twitter, y'all would buy every lie the police tell you about the black folks they murder from Ferguson to Breonna Taylor. And then GN Cordova writes, without Twitter, there wouldn't even really be lies to buy because we wouldn't have heard about the vast majority of those cases. Without Twitter, Ahmed Arbery's killers would have never been arrested. George Floyd's death, even with the video, likely wouldn't have sparked national outrage. Without Twitter, we're at the mercy of news outlets for reporting, and you see how they publish police reports as fact. All right. Give us your thoughts. I don't uh, totally agree with where these people are coming from, but it's a good take. It's, it's true. It is. It's it's true. It's correct. Um, I think this was in the context of with like hashtag without Twitter or just without Twitter was trending because everyone's freaking out about how Elon's burning it to the ground, even though it's doing fine. Um, and so you know, it's there's kind of the the usual, and and I have I have good friends who who make these jokes and say these things, um, and I'm sorry. It's a brain dead take. <laughs> you guys know who you are and I love you. But, you know, without Twitter, nothing of value would be lost. Or like without without Twitter, the world would be better a place. And it's like, okay, all you're saying at this point is like, <laughs> you're saying that nothing of value is lost. Nothing is brought to the table by Twitter and everything has been horrible. And that is the classic human predisposition to focus on the negative it's the classic why news you know corporate news and just in general news people love to report negative stories rather than positive ones because people love to focus on the negative if you have a day where 10 people compliment you but one person set uh, insults you you'll fixate on that insult and that's to me what's going on with the twitter thing and so this this that's what sort of the the, the backdrop for, for why everyone was tweeting that way and uh and this person's highlighting how Twitter actually does provide value. Now, the specific case of like, without George Floyd's death, it wouldn't have sparked national outrage. I actually kind of disagree because I think that there's um, a lot that the corporate journalists really like to highlight. And in the case of like George Floyd, I think the corporate news outlets ran with that. I don't think you needed Twitter for that to be a thing. And I would say that that's probably one of the negative examples. However, uh, other other cases that weren't, that, you know, the the, the more... I would say more justified outrage incidents that that were not sparking national debate. I wouldn't have known about if it hadn't been for Twitter. You think yeah. about cases like, I mean, Ahmed Arbery, I think is a good example of that being just a, a horrific example. Or uh, is it Dylan Schaefer? Was that his name? Yeah. Um, who's uh, who's I believe just I think the trial just happened, and and uh, I think there's oh, really? going to be some accountability in, oh, in a good, good. way. Um, but it's like, you know, examples like that are, are the ones that the corporate media didn't propagate. I learned about because of the Internet, because of Twitter, because of the value that um, individuals being able to spread message without this corporate uh, entity uh, providing, I, you know, I, I, I think Twitter's provided immense value in that respect. And so I think this is a good take. Yeah, it, it's definitely true. I don't necessarily agree with the leanings that these people have with, with, you know, with their points and everything. Um, or I guess not even their leanings, but their, uh, I guess their predisposition towards certain yeah. political things that that's inferred, but they're absolutely true. And I think this is more true broadly of the internet. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think this is why, uh, Elon Musk buying Twitter and, and hopefully not, not fulfilling what he said earlier in the take that we took on earlier. I hope he doesn't do that because Twitter, you know, with the vaccine stuff, with all of the COVID things, with all of the different wars, not just Twitter, but the internet in general, you know, people, it, it, has, it has eliminated the ability of there to be one narrative put out there uh, that everyone buys into. Now everyone can like weigh all the evidence that is crowdsourced by, by everyone around the globe uh, and decide for themselves. It reminded me, I, I thought of putting this take up there, but there was an article, I think it was by the uh, uh, Washington Times. And it was like only six percent of uh, six percent of Africa is vaxxed, 
uh, but they're doing better COVID wise than any anywhere else. Uh, it's like no experts are baffled by it. But it's like sure the experts are baffled by it and the news outlets are baffled by it. But all of us that were on Twitter and followed the right people knew about this literally two and a half years ago. Um, so not two and a half years ago, I guess about a year and a half ago when the vaccine first hit wide market. Um, so that's, yeah, Twitter's amazing for that. The internet in general is amazing for that. All the more reason for it to be, uh, kept free and to not, you know, limit certain types of speech. Uh, you know, as people get, as, as it kind of expands, like what's great about it is you can, like I was saying, you can source all these different people's opinions and facts and evidence that they put on there and then people can weigh it for themselves. And yes, you know, the, one of the points that the political people that want to limit what can be put on Twitter or not is that, well, some people are too dumb to weigh the evidence or some people are too dumb or there's some methods that are too sophisticated. But it's like, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened over the years in terms of technological advances that could have deceived a lot of people. Uh, but we become smarter as we go along and we, we learn to recognize the things that are fake. And so why not just let it all be out there? You know, if, if the mainstream media can get things wrong or lie to us, uh, that doesn't mean that other people on Twitter can't lie to us as well, but at least we now have all the facts and competing views that we can weigh against each other. And so, uh, without Twitter, it, you know, I think a lot of other a lot of people would not be as awake as they uh, they are today, or red pilled, probably to use use our terms more. Yeah, woke or red pilled, pick your yeah. poison, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, I I think that uh, you know the the corporate if if you're worried about people being too dumb or misinterpreting things on Twitter or you know jumping to conclusions and then tweeting something that also happens in corporate journalism at best by accident, because frankly, a lot of people who get promoted in the corporate journalist world aren't that impressive of people. Um, and at worst, they do it maliciously and, and they do it intentionally incorrectly and inaccurately and in ways to specifically lie us into war or lie us into a, you know, just absolute gargantuan bailout for for big pharma or whatever whatever the examples are um you have plenty of examples that the corporate people act as though corporate journalist standards existing means they are being implemented and while it's true that in many cases like the new york times will have to issue a retraction for something if there's a correction and joe Schmo on twitter doesn't um the problem with that is that on the Issues that really matter, uh, everyone gives false validity to things like the New York Times uh, when they're actively co collaborating with the government to lie you into war um, versus being able to see the actual on-ground footage of something like Twitter where you sound that, well, that's not reliable because it's not this corporate media or whatever. And and. Well, yeah. Go, go ahead before I. Well, well, I think I think the other aspect I, it made me think of the the ghost of Kiev uh, thing. Yeah. You know, it's it's not only <laughs> is Twitter and the internet useful for getting everyone else's perspectives out there. It's also you put something out there, you've literally got thousands or millions of people that want to fact check it uh, themselves. Yep. And so the ghost of Kiev thing was so funny because they literally used different types of video game uh, renders to to mm -hmm. like put that hoax out there, and people were able to recognize it and, and you know and and uh, and demonstrate how this was a fake story. And so that's really useful too, right? It turns out that decentralized communication, the ability of people to all pull their their mental abilities together uh, and their observations together is a really powerful and awesome thing. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not <laughs> maybe not as a uh, fact check debunk noble as as the, you know, taking down the ghost of Kiev. But I, I always think of the um, <laughs> the story about uh, oh, what's his name? Is it it's, Shia uh, LaBeouf with, with the Shia, yeah, Shia LaBeouf? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And his we, he will not divide us flag and how the Internet <laughs> went, you know, col collaborated and had, you know, found it in the middle of nowhere. You know, this camera is like shooting up into the sky to this flag so you hypothetically can't tell where it is supposed to be a live stream constantly going of this flag <laughs> saying he will not divide us meaning trump and people on the internet figured out where it was based on the plane flights overhead and and sort of the identifying fauna and like the sounds and then they had a like guy that. drive and honk yep. his horn around exactly they played, yep they played like hot and, cool and then a pepe, pepe the frog flag got raised up like <laughs> exactly. so this funny. happened this happened like he kept he kept moving it to different locations and they kept finding it. I mean, to the point where one time uh, they literally had a, someone had a drone and they made like a flamethrower and flew it up to the flag and burned. And oh, burned it's amazing. It. So it's so, so funny. Yeah. This, this decentralized masses can, can actually verify and fact check and find stuff out really quickly. Um, and 
you know, it's uh, the and, and just in general, like you were saying, the internet broadly has done this. And I mean, like I think specifically of how much a, a a school curriculum is going to teach you and how much you don't know. And even if not in a malicious way, there's just so many things that like you can't learn in a school lifetime of you know whatever your your standardized education is going to be that you can now pick up in in amazing ways on on the internet and on Twitter and that's for live you know live news as well as historic things i mean i remember uh being specifically my anti war leanings really got ignited with finding out the whole controversy about uh hiroshima and nagasaki and yeah. um the whole setup for that is just infuriating if you haven't read that there's the great uh, great documents of of the entire series of events of how fdr specifically baited uh japan into bombing us and put his soldier our soldiers out specifically in a vulnerable location to die for for that and then also about how there were so much negotiation going on as far as whether or not we needed to drop the second bomb which we absolutely didn't why it, it wasn't a military target all this kind of stuff but you know that's not specifically talking about twitter here per se but those kinds of perspectives can get out in real time because it's like these perspectives historically should be known and i only found out about that from from an internet from the internet because i i had a debate in school thankfully about it which was awesome because my education wanted to promote those kinds of things um but i had to find that out from online the internet and so it's like how much better would it be if at the time people were able to disseminate that information live and it's like look FDR is doing these things and and positioning our troops out in this way. This is really sketchy and dangerous. And if you could avert avert that crisis in real time, how much better would it be if Twitter had existed back then? I I tend to think that it would actually have helped a lot um, and maybe spared uh, thousands of lives. Yeah, it would have been. It, we're we're definitely better off with uh, all these things existing. Yep. At least more informed. Yeah. Well, and it's like any good you know any tool. There's going to yep. be bad uses as well, but. Generally speaking, I think it's been more helpful. Yeah. All right. We've got a Facebook post by the other 98% of Facebook page. Uh, it's a picture of Dolly Parton. And uh, she's standing in front of, uh, it looks like the, the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy. And uh, the text reads, let's be clear. Dolly Parton is a millionaire and not a billionaire because she keeps giving money away. Billion, being a billionaire is a moral failing. She gives away shockingly large amounts of money every year and is still richer than you and I will ever be. <laughs> now, what's really funny about this is, is I Googled, and I'll let you get yours in, but I just, I just yeah, Googled yeah. this before. Um, I Googled how much money Dolly Parton has given away, and it's pretty, not sure, but she give, she, her net worth is about $350 million. Eight days ago, Jeff Bezos, one of these evil billionaires who might be evil, but regardless, just because he's a billionaire does not mean he's evil, gave Dolly Parton $100 million to figure out how to give away. So I don't know. I, it's, 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 it's just so, it's so funny how these people choose to make their arguments. I think it's a bad take. What oh, do you it's think? a terrible take. I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of angles you can come at it from, but the one that jumps out to me at the start is, What's uh, what's the arbitrary distinction about being a billionaire being a moral failure and not a millionaire? Why is it like, why is that that you know uh, particular demarcation uh, a moral failing? You know, what if someone's making seven hundred thousand dollars a year as a single individual, um, no family, and not supporting any causes? Is that more or less a moral failing than someone who's making, let's say, a billion dollars? Uh, a year with a family and is donating to charitable causes. Like to me, the moral failing is the person who's making 700,000 and not giving anything away. Yep. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It, it matters. How, now, so, so in this case, it's like Dolly Parton's a millionaire, not a billionaire. Cause she keeps giving money away. That's awesome. That's great. I'm, I'm super glad that with what she has, she's able to give away money in those ways and to be a philanthropist. That's super cool. It's super important for our culture to, 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 you know, praise people for doing stuff like that yeah that's awesome let's be clear though jeff bezos isn't you know it's not like he and dolly parton are at the same level and the only difference between them is jeff bezos didn't give away his money and so that's why he's a billionaire not a millionaire there was a vastly different amount of value created by those two individuals to start with and now jeff bezos is able to give away more money than she can because he's a billionaire not a millionaire so 
I, I don't understand. They, again, this is one of those, you know, it's not not quite banana, banana peel level as our previous take, but it's one of those takes where the, 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 the starting premise and the ending conclusion have very little actual linkage. They just use terms that make them sound related, but yeah. they don't actually give any real reason as to why uh, why they're connected. Yeah, and I, I don't know much about Dolly Parton's charitable giving or anything. Maybe she's a wonderful lady. Maybe she's not. I don't really know her. I do know that she gave a million dollars to the uh, the COVID research. for I can't remember which university. So in that way, I think that was a pretty poor choice. Um, but it, it, you're, you're right. That's it's Being a billionaire is not indicative of being a moral failure. How you become a billionaire could be indicative, right, of, of a moral failure. If, if you got your, your billions from, you know, hurting people and stealing and defrauding people and all those different things, uh, then yeah, it would be pretty bad. The fact is like people like, sure, maybe Jeff Bezos, maybe Bill Gates, maybe all these guys have done some questionable things on their business operations, but at the same time, they've employed millions of people, made it possible for millions of other people to generate money uh, and just made overall more stuff, right? More stuff for people to go around. The solution to uh, poverty, the solution to want, the solution to scarcity is not redistributing what we already have. It's creating more. Uh, so there's more to go around. And most of the time, being a billionaire, billionaires do not become billionaires because uh, by making things expensive. They become billionaires by making things cheaper, more affordable, easier to get, better quality. Um, and so ironically, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos will give away way more, like on a magnitude of like 100 more, uh, maybe even a 1,000 more than Dolly Parton could ever give away in her lifetime. He just pledged, uh, I think it was like 10 days ago or something like that, to give away his entire his entire wealth by the time he passes away. Same with him like Warren Buffett, same thing with Bill Gates. I don't necessarily like where some of these guys are giving their money to and all these different things. But uh, they, the point is, is that they are planning to give it away. They don't have, they can't spend it all in their lifetime. They know that someone that's smart enough to get to that point is smart enough to know that. Um, and the other aspect of it too, you know, people criticize Jeff Bezos. It's like, well, a hundred million dollars to him, you know, when he's worth $125 billion is like nothing. It's like, yeah, Jeff Bezos doesn't have, you know, a pool full of gold that he swims around like Scrooge McDuck. That's $125 billion and he decided to give a coin. He might only have access to a billion dollars worth of liquid from that at any point in time. And if he tried to access all $125 billion, like he would not have $125 billion left, right? Like, because you have to sell off shares, you have to sell off equity. Most of that exists in the former stocks or in, uh, in, in assets that are not liquid uh, themselves. And so, you know, I, I tend to, uh, with people that have made billions of dollars, I tend to think that they have a better plan for how to give away their money than I could ever come up with. I think in order to give away that much money, you have to first figure out how to make it. Uh, and so, you know, the reason Dolly Parton's not a billionaire is because she's not a billionaire. She didn't make a billion dollars. She can give away as much as she wants, and maybe that's her choice, right? But she didn't make a billion dollars. She didn't employ a billions of dollars worth of people or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that this take is really bad because not only is it hyping someone up that, I mean, she's doing great stuff, I'm sure, in some ways, but it's hyping someone up that is is less than uh, ideal compared to someone like Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, uh, and not only their charitable giving, but in just the overall value that they provided for the world. Yeah, I, 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 I think the difference is you hear a lot about Dolly Parton going in and doing this stuff herself, and I think that that's because in this period of time you know she, i mean if i'm not mistaken she you know she's she's an entertainment figure at at some point was her you know rise to r prominence um and you know no no offense to her or anyone else generally speaking what there are you know prime and peak season of people's careers and sometimes that's in later years for certain actors or celebrities and sometimes it's earlier for them and i would you know, unless she makes a, an amazing comeback and, you know, stars in some incredible movie or puts out some incredible song or something, you know, now she's probably past her prime in terms of where her stardom is. And so now she's focused a lot on, you know, being directly involved in this kind of charitable giving and, you know, figuring out where funds go and doing that kind of stuff. And that's cool. Good work. It also gives her a lot of publicity. And so people like to give her praise for that sort of thing. But it, Again, it's like, yeah, yeah, you need people doing that specifically, but it's also you need the money behind it. And so the fact that she can do both is great, but it's also probably good that like Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk and people who are going to give away money in a lot of in, in large quantities are still doing things that are generating more money 
while letting other people figure out the specific ways to distribute and effectively provide help for people. Like having, you know, sort of other people take that on and and uh, distributing that role and responsibility for these very other busy people who have, you know, you have a limited number of days and a little bit limited amount of energy of things you can do. So distributing that work to other people is still just as effective, if not more, because you're still yeah. providing value. The, the difference being, of course, you're not being the public face of it. So the fact that Dolly Parton does this all the time and, and is a recurring face in this kind of charitable giving, again, awesome. I'm, gl I'm glad for it. I, I wish more people would do that, though a, a lot do, but I wish more people were more active about it. But she gets the benefit of doing that herself because she's not currently in the, in the height of the, the amount of value that she's providing and making and, and things like that. Yeah, I I, and I, I want to kind of reframe what I was saying earlier because I've it may have come across being really harsh about Dolly Parton, but like what I meant by ideal is that Dolly Parton made her wealth by taking money from people who do produce things by being an entertainer, right? right? right. Nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying like it's not like she worked with her own two hands and created something awesome uh, that created more things that actually raised other people out of poverty just through the virtue of it existing. No, she she did some entertaining things. People that did make things chose to exchange the value of what they created to watch her or listen to her do whatever she was doing. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, John Mackey, all of these guys created stuff. They made the pie bigger. They made the supply of things available to everyone more abundant. Uh, and out of that abundance, they created even more wealth for themselves and they're giving that wealth away. So it's when I say like ideal, that's what I mean. Like there, there's yeah. someone who created actual things and then out of the abundance of those things is also giving even more. Like that's a really impressive person. Dolly Parton took money from people that were working and entertained them, which is good. And there's value in that. I don't have, I'm a, I've been a musician myself. There's nothing wrong with that. People will pay for it, but it's not like she's more virtuous, you know, by, by, by being able to do that. And it's really weird to me that the left idolizes her so much because it's like she is the example of the elite that produced nothing. Um, and then being like, hey, I'm just going to give away, you know, money from people that did produce something, which is it's just kind of weird to me. That's it. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and I agree. I mean, she is able to have that wealth because of people who have created things for that wealth to be generated from. You can't have Dolly Parton first and then Bill Gates, right? You have to yeah. have the Bill Gates first and then the Dolly Parton. I mean, <laughs> proverbially yeah. speaking, not not literally. but. Um, so yeah, and 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 it's funny. I mean, I think about a lot of people who are younger who who get into wealth through things like entertainment. I think they actually have this kind of um implicit understanding even if they don't even if their politics aren't great. I I think about like streamers like Ludwig or someone if you're familiar with him, but he you know, he's he's I think he's about my age and he he's gotten very big on Twitch and YouTube and stuff like that and he has just ab absurd amounts of money for someone his age because he's created so much entertainment value for people that they've watched they've subscribed they've done all these things and he does a lot of charitable things with his money which is awesome and i think he's also putting stuff away you know so that he or, or like mr beast he gives away money all the time but also reinvests in himself but there's there is a an attitude amongst them where i think they realize they're like like what i'm doing it, like i'm putting an effort and, I, and it and it is work but like it's not the same level of hard work as like actually creating things. And so I like that level of self-awareness. Unfortunately, I think their politics get go a little bit wrong, but having that level of self-awareness is great. And it's funny because I think the, the other 98% here doesn't have that level of self-awareness that I think a lot of people themselves actually might. I don't know about Dolly Parton, um, but at least people in our generation who, who are getting these large sums of money uh, for doing things that aren't creating things, I think they actually realize like, wow, this is a little bit off balance, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard. So I'll, I'll try to give it back as well and try to be charitable and all that kind of stuff. But there is that realization that I think goes over the head of the, the other 98%. Yep. yep. Awesome. Any more on this one? Are you good? I don't think so. All right. Friends, thanks so much for uh, hanging out with us. This will probably air on Thanksgiving or the day after. So happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And uh, we'll catch you next week. <laughs>